So welcome to the Patients with Veterans Affairs, or VA, and Medicare coverage. This webinar is designed to go over a bunch of information related to that, and it will be built off of questions that were asked during previous webinars. So what happened was we've had Medicare secondary payer webinars. During those webinars, we got a lot of questions about coverage when the Veterans Affairs primary to Medicare and when it's not. So we're gonna discuss that. We're gonna try to get through those questions. So the contents of my webinar, the slides themselves were actually built to answer those questions and to cover that material. So more to come as we go. That's why um, it should be something you get if you have information available to you. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Um, and we'll get you that information. A couple of things I want to make you aware of. A couple of people asked us about the portal, the secure section, um, and if there's information on Veterans Affair on the secure section, and I will let you know that there's not, but also that we are um, updating that section of our website. It should be back at the end of spring-ish when this is all done, so I can't really help you too much there. Um, but I will get back to you a little bit more as we go. Um, so, yeah, I'll talk more about that later, but just know that the secure section is being updated. It doesn't actually have the Veterans Affairs Administration, and I'll answer the remainder of those questions as we get into the content. We do always have to give a disclaimer. So this education was prepared to assist you. It is not the final rules and regulations of Medicare. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a section from the Social Security Act, which tells you why we are doing what we're doing when it comes to Medicare and the VA. So we'll get into that. If you want those official regulations, you can go out and check the CMS website. The information is there also and available to you. We'll be thinking like the Social Security Act, if you Google it with this section, if I give you a link or something like that. So I want you to be well aware of it. All right, we are recording this. I'll let you know more about that. Uh, we will provide responses to the questions that you gave us. Now, remember I said a lot of these slides are built based on the questions that were already submitted and the pre-submitted questions that you sent in. So the information is based on that. So if there's more to come, um, it's going to be a variety of different things. And we want to keep that in mind. But always the Medicare final rules, the Medicare determinations, and the federal laws will override us if we give you information here. So keep that in mind. You're responsible for knowing that as a provider responsibility. CMS does prohibit the recording of this presentation for profit making purposes. Because we can't ensure how you're going to use the presentation, we just say don't record it at all. On the other hand, what we're going to do is put an encore of this out there. It'll be available on our website uh, with a link to YouTube. And the encore will actually be in YouTube. So you'll be able to play it on our website. You'll be able to download the uh, presentation on our website as well. So we want to make sure you're um, well aware of how to get to all of those different pieces of information. If you are a YouTube user and you are allowed to go to YouTube, you can go directly to YouTube and view it from our channel. That's also going to be there. Our Encore playlist should be available in the chat for you right now. So what is our goal for today? What are we trying to do with this webinar? First, I'm trying to get you to understand the process of when a patient has Veterans Affairs coverage and Medicare coverage and how the two work together so that you aren't billing incorrectly and you aren't getting um, overpayments and you aren't getting other problems or have additional questions put in. So we want to talk about the patient's choice of coverage. We want to talk about when to bill Medicare or the VA. Then we want to talk about how the VA and Medicare coverage work with primary insurance. A little bit about that. Now, this one definitely came from those questions related to MSP, um, Medicare secondary payer, or when there's a primary before Medicare. So we will talk a little bit about that um, to kind of get you through that basic information. All right, let's get started with the first section. Again, that's patient's choice. So this section is designed to help you determine who to bill. What are the regulations that dictate who should be billing when and what do you need on file? What kind of documentation might be important? So let's get started here. First thing you have to be aware of is that the Social Security Act prohibits two federal programs from paying for the same service. This means you can bill Medicare or the VA, but not Medicare and the VA. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go, because sometimes you say, but I billed the VA and they didn't pay, they didn't authorize it, therefore I billed Medicare. That means 
that the VA didn't pay, right? If it's not paid and not authorized, then yes, Medicare can consider it. So we'll get into that because that doesn't violate the Social Security Act because they're not paying at the same time. Two federal programs cannot pay. For those of you that are not aware, this is the Social Security Act, Sec 1862, 1862A3. Let me show you how I find that because we did have a couple of questions um, on where this is based from and why we do what we do related to this. So first thing I'm gonna do is simply come out to the website um, and I'm gonna open my server. I'm gonna go to Google. Not gonna go to any particular website because you know you may not know which website to go to. I'm just gonna paste Social Security Act, section 1862A3. This is what I told you, this is what you're gonna do. Go ahead and hit paste on that. It'll bring it up, okay, 1862? Yep, that's right here. When we open up 1862, again, you wanna make sure you're in ssa.gov, Social Security Administration from the Social Security Act. But 1862, and you're gonna say, okay, I want A, here's A, and then here's one, two, and three, which are paid directly or indirectly. This is where that information actually came from. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and put this link in the chat for you. Again, um, hopefully see it pop up here. That link is related to the Social Security Act. And again, you're looking at A and you're looking at three when you get into that. So it is something that, that is not negotiable. In other words, we as a contractor have no right to pay anything or to override a federal law. That does need to be done in a federal court. So there's a variety of other factors that come into play with that. Okay. Let's move back to our PowerPoint. So if the VA does not pay, then Medicare can pay. That's key because remember it says prohibits two federal programs from paying. So when the VA authorizes it, it's paid at 100% based on their authorization. If they don't authorize it, they're not gonna pay for it. Therefore we can't. We cannot act supplemental to each other if we're both paying and there's no liability. Do not confuse this with TRICARE. TRICARE and the VA are separate payment programs. This is not about TRICARE. This is about VA and VA coverage only. TRICARE is military insurance under the Department of Health for people that are active duty or retired military. VA is a separate program under regulations for the Department of Defense. So hopefully everyone is aware of that and we're not gonna get into the, anything related to TRICARE here. One of the questions that came up was, does a patient have the right to say, I do not want to use my VA coverage or I do not want to use my Medicare coverage and should we document that? The answer is absolutely you need to document that because otherwise many of you will get a patient's signature, right? What does the patient's signature say in most cases? That they're allowing you to bill any insurance coverage that they had. Now, if they have a file, that's fine, go ahead and bill. Other hand, if they say, I do not want you to bill an insert, I don't want you to bill Veterans Affair, I do not want you to bill Medicare, or even I don't want you to bill my insurance at all under any circumstances, you want that documented. It could be something separate from your regular signature on file documentation, but you do need to follow it. So I would always recommend you have something in place telling us why this is. That's what this slide is about is to answer that question. Can the patient choose to use one or the other? And the answer is absolutely they can. On the other hand, you don't follow the VA rules, therefore it's not authorized as a provider outside of the VA, then yes, you can bill Medicare under the general signature on file rules contained within the patient's signature. So if you have questions on that and more on that, please put that into chat. I'll get some more information for you and kind of help you out there. Reasons. Uh, one of the other questions that came up when I was developing the material was, why would someone choose to use the VA? Why would they choose to use Medicare? Why would they use one or the other? What's the whole point here? Well, first of all, the VA, the thing that a lot of people choose the VA is if it's an authorized service, they don't leave a patient liability amount. So the VA does require the authorizations for outside providers, but they're gonna pay it at 100%. Now, that's not true for all Medicare services if you're familiar with Medicare. So that's why they may choose to use the VA. The VA can set limitations. So they can say, hey, this inpatient coverage is for so many days or this 
observation care is for so many days and the patient may need more care than that. And so then they have to go and try to reapply, could be denied or a variety of other things can happen. So with that, it's a little bit different. Medicare uses medical necessity versus a certain number of days for certain things. So why would you choose Medicare? Well, yes, there's a patient liability, but it does offer some of those different flexibilities that you don't necessarily have, especially if they remain on traditional fee-for-service Medicare. Also, while the VA may require you to go to a certain organization or area or be close to, or you may feel that facility is too far away, Medicare does not have that requirement, right? It can be anyone enrolled within Medicare. So that's why a patient may choose it. Well, they do have a liability, it is still a Medicare program. But remember, once the VA pays, Medicare cannot pay for it. So that's where we talk about those payment requirements. Now they may choose to use the Medicare program because they like the Medicare program covering this where the VA says no, or the opposite, right? The VA covers this, but Medicare says no. So they'll choose to, to move around that program and they do have the right to do that. They can choose on a service by service basis, which one they want. We did receive a question um, on non-covered services, so I thought I would put this in there right away. Does the VA cover everything? The answer is no. The VA has coverage limitations just like Medicare does. If on the other, you get something back and it says this is a non-covered VA service, this does not mean it is not a Medicare covered service. It could still fall within our coverage limitations and could still be billed to Medicare as primary. Now you may need to indicate that, hey, I did did bill the VA, but I didn't get the response, or the patient wants me to bill. We'll talk more about some of those situations in a little while. Um, Medicare does not cover the service. They would only go to the VA. Now, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, neither one covers it, and what do we do? Well, maybe you have a Medicare supplement for that patient, and if that patient chooses that, then yes, that's fine. So it's a little bit different there. So remember, the VA covers, but Medicare doesn't. That's outside authorized. Good, Medicare covers, but the VA doesn't cover it. The patient liability would apply. And could you use a supplemental coverage? Absolutely, there's no reason that you can't use a Medicare supplement in any situation where Medicare leaves a liability that is owed that has not been paid. And so that doesn't, that would mean the VA obviously didn't cover it either. So if the VA covered it, they're paying it 100% and you wouldn't even bill Medicare. So a couple of different things going on there. Hopefully all of that makes sense to you when it comes to non-covered services, and, but you do need to check one of the questions I did want to address uh, was, is there a basic Medicare covered coverage list of, for non-covered services? And so I thought I'd show this to you real quick. It's just some additional information. If you go to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, it's the cms.gov website. If I go to Medicare, underneath here, I go to, oops, regulations and guidance and I go to manuals. When I open the manuals on the left side, you're gonna go to the internet only manuals. The Medicare coverage benefits and policy manual is actually 100-02, the Medicare benefit policy manual. Now inside here, this explains when we cover what, all of those basic things, gives you your basic coverage. But if we scroll down, and it is gonna be a little ways down, I think it's like chapter maybe 16 or so. Yep, chapter 16, general exclusions from coverage. This chapter contains all of those Medicare excluded services. And if it's in this chapter and you do have to build Medicare, then you would want to append the GY modifier, the condition code to indicate that it's not a covered service. And I forget for the part A billers, I, I don't remember the condition code off the top of my head. I apologize for that. So thought I would uh, allow you guys to all have that. One of the other questions um, came up about VA coverage and about VA providers in particular. Sometimes VA providers do choose to enroll in Medicare and people are like, wait, wait, they can't bill. Why would they enroll? That is correct. A VA provider cannot bill Medicare for a service, but a VA provider can enroll in Medicare so that when they order or refer a provider and it's going to be covered outside of the VA program, whether it's the patient's choice not to use the authorized VA or whatever the situation is, 
that order or re referral is still recognized because if they're not enrolled within the provider enrollment chain and ownership system, PCOS, as an ordering or referring provider, Medicare will deny this service. It's not a valid ordering and referring provider. So many VA providers do enroll with Medicare and they do it for that reason. They're enrolling simply to be ordering and referring providers and to make sure that those denials do not happen should their patient choose to not follow through with the authorized service or should the VA not authorize a service and say no we have this but the patient says I'd really like to go to my own provider and so therefore the VA would say well we'll pay for it if you get it done in a VA facility but because you're choosing that I'll give you the referral or the order and you can go to an outside provider we're just not going to pay for it that also happens but in order to be recognized and to have that even considered by Medicare they do have to enroll as an order or referring provider with all of that information given so far, those are some just pretty high level information trying to answer some of those questions, but still provide you with some basic background. We are at our first set of questions and I do have three or four that I'd like to cover and then we'll open it up. So if you have questions, put them in chat. Let's get those answered as quickly as we can. So questions, uh, how do you coordinate benefits when billing both the VA and Medicare? Remember I mentioned you don't actually coordinate benefits. If the VA pays, Medicare will not. If Medicare pays, that means the VA did not pay. This is an either or situation, not an and situation. So that's what you have to keep in mind. Is it appropriate to bill Medicare if the patient is actively receiving care at the VA? Well, this depends on the care. If the care is authorized by the VA, and even though they're actively receiving care at the VA, they come to you as an outside entity and it's authorized by the VA and you are allowed to bill the VA for that, and you will want to bill the VA. Once the VA makes that decision, there's a variety of other factors that can go into it. If at any time the VA says, we're not paying for this, then you can move to Medicare. So I wasn't really sure exactly which way the person was going with that. So if you want to give me some more information, that'd be great. Does the CMS regulations manual guidance for coding and billing for traditional Medicare also apply to the VA accounts? And the answer is we don't apply any of our guidance to anything for the VA. So if you're billing Medicare, you need to follow our guidance. If you're billing the VA, then you need to follow the VA guidance. It's not going to go one across the board just because we're both federal bene benefits or federal insurance programs. That's not how it works. When you bill the VA, follow their guidance. When you bill Medicare, follow our guidance. With that, I would like to give the opportunity to see if we have any questions. So Leanne, do we have any questions? And Tom, we do have a couple of questions. The first one is regarding the statement on file. The question is, is there a, is there a specific lang language that is that this form needs to have? And is there a form available or do we have to make our own? Great question, and no, there's no specific language. The statement on file um, would be something sim sim similar to your signature on file form that authorizes them, um, that authorizes you to bill Medicare on the patient's behalf, or any actually any insurance. So it's your general signature on file. The other portion of that, and could you make your own? Sure, and it can be something as simple as adding some general information or writing a little note on there saying, hey, this patient doesn't want this any of that type of information, but you wanna make sure you have it documented somewhere. So we don't have a specific form and there is no specified language or anything like that. What we're looking for is that legally, if someone were to come back later, can you explain why you did not bill the choice that you did not bill, whether that's the VA or that's Medicare, whatever the situation is. So uh, next question, please. Next question is, what if Medicare shows the VA as an MSP payer? So if Medicare shows the VA as an MSP payer, then that record needs to be updated. Um, if that's stopping claims from processing, then it needs to go back to the Benefit Coordination and Recovery Center and you need to get the MSP record updated now. Uh, so that's a, a different situation where it would not be an MSP file, but we would need to get that updated. Um, so you may even need to get a, something from the VA saying, no, we're not partial. The patient can get that updated. There's a variety of different factors that can happen in that. Next question. Next question is, we have been told that VA does pay as secondary, but doesn't pay copay or deductible, but does pay coinsurance. Would that be true? 
So when the VA pays a secondary that's outside of the Medicare realm, now I do know that there is a program that allows the VA to bill Medicare. Now we're not gonna make a payment. What is happening is the VA is sending us a claim and so we send back a statement saying, hey, you paid it, great, blah, blah, blah. Here's our patient liabilities, should we have paid as primary? And then there's some rules and regulations that the VA has under a claims adjustment service project. I mean, that adjustment service project works to allow them to bill certain things and to do certain things. That's not something we're involved in. Our portion of that in Medicare is about getting them the bill so that they know how much it's owed. I do want to show you where you're going to find that information if you are interested in the claim adjustment service project, because this may be what we're talking about, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so first, we're going to go back into those manuals. Right now we're in the benefit policy manual, so we're 100 02. I'm going to jump back just one second. You go to the claims processing manual, which is 100 04. Then we're going to scroll down and we're actually looking way down at the bottom to chapter 30, 30, what is it? 37, Department of Veteran Affairs Claim Adjustment Service Project. This will explain that project more fully. I mean, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're talking about or if it's something related to the VA billing us or billing someone else's secondary, that's on them. But this is the one time when the VA would bill Medicare to get those amounts so that they could bill a secondary service, okay? Next question. The next question is, does the VA cover skilled nursing facility at the provider of choice post-acute for veterans with 70 service connection? Um, it looks like the VA approved surgery at 50%. If they don't have Medicare, then they just have no coverage for SNF, if not enough service connection. So um, I can't tell you whether or not the VA is going to cover that. That doesn't have anything to do with us. I can tell you we will not consider it if they do not have Medicare, so it may be their own responsibility, but that's on the VA to determine coverage, not on us. Next. Yep. Um, how does it work when it's an ambulance transport and there is no authorization prior to billing VA? So if it's an ambulance transport, the VA then has to consider whether it was an emergent transport, a non-emergent transport, whether they're going to cover it and all of those things. So there's a variety of factors that go into billing an ambulance transport. It is a little bit more specific. Um, so, but, but, this, but the key principle applies, right? If the VA does cover it, regardless of authorization or not, then we're not going to cover it. If the VA does not cover it, then you can bill Medicare. Uh, so, uh, unless the patient tells you just straight out bill Medicare, then that's a different situation. You're just going to bill Medicare. So, hopefully that answers the question, but remember, it's up to the VA to determine their coverage. And then if they don't cover it, we'll cover it as primary. Next. Next is, if the claim was billed to VA using their guidance and they refuse to pay, should the claim be recoded using CMS guidance? Is that allowed or should it be billed to Medicare as is? So if the guidance from VA and CMS are different, you do need to follow both guidance. So you may have to recode it or you may have to adjust it to follow the CMS guidelines. And then you just make a note, follow CMS guidelines, this is why it's done. So it looked this way to the VA, but it looks this way to Medicare. That's um, not something that is against the rules or of either one. It's just something that happens um, as a technical issue when you're working with two different types of programs, uh, two different types of federal programs with two different types of federal guidelines. Next. All right. Um, one more question. If the patient comes in and we bill VA, but they deny, do we have to ask the patient if we can then bill Medicare or can we just automatically bill Medicare? It's going to depend. Um, so with this one, I want you to remember, we talked about that signature on file and it's going to depend on what the signature on file is. If you have a general signature on file that says you can bill any of my insurances on my behalf, good, good, good. Awesome. You don't need to ask the patient. You don't need to do anything, right? They've already told you, hey, the VA denied. Now I'm going to bill Medicare. You gave me a signature. I'm good. On the other hand, if the patient has a signature on file and says, I only want you to bill the VA. I don't want you to bill my Medicare. Um, you could, you would have to follow that guidance. What would support you in not billing Medicare is the fact they told you not to bill Medicare. So you could automatically bill, possibly not. It really just depends on what you have on that signature record. So hopefully that makes sense. That is all for the questions at this time. All right, perfect. All right, so we're gonna move on a little bit here. When to bill. 
This section contains information for the most asked questions about let's cover when to build each one, what you need to be aware of. And so I wanted to summarize everything and just bring you a few slides and talk straight about it in this manner. All right, build a VA for authorized services, emergency services, and at the patient's request. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't incorporate any other type. We're just talking about Veterans Affairs VA claim. So if you add in, oh, suddenly there's another portion of this, or this is this type of, that's a different thing. That's not what we're talking about today. This is VA. If you contact the VA and say they have that one, but they have this type of program, it's two different things. So we're just talking about VA programs here. You will bill for emergency services. These are not authorized in a lot of cases. Why? It's an emergency. You don't want to stop and get the authorization and deny that patient care. So it's just some information um, that you need to be aware of, if that makes sense. But so an emergency service and maybe the ambulance service that we requested and we talked about. So what they'll do is they'll look at it and determine if it meets their requirements for an emergency service. And if it doesn't, and you do have the signature on file, then you can build Medicare for that service. Should it meet the Medicare requirements? So hopefully that one makes sense as well. Also, you can build a VA at the patient's request. The VA, the patient's automatically gonna say, hey, do this. I only want you to do this or hey, build a VA. Then if they don't build Medicare, that's all patient request or patient choice. So definitely be aware of that. So that's when you would wanna build a VA according to what we know of. Now, there may be other situations that come up or arise and you wanna be aware of them. That's okay too, right? We're just working only from the Medicare perspective. So, when would you bill Medicare? The patient does not want you to bill the VA. Now, you're going to tell us that. And I'm going to tell you how to do that in a little while in the claim. The patient says, nope, don't do this. Okay? VA denies the service as not authorized. So, the patient can say, I want you to bill the VA for this service. Awesome. The VA comes back and says, yep, we're not paying it because there's no authorization. Okay, so we get that. Now you want to bill Medicare, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because you'll bill it with Medicare, and you'll bill it as if they're um, is to, to let us know that it's a primary and that it's not an authorized service. We'll talk more about that in a little while. So the VA does pay for some outpatient services and not others. So there are certain locations within the jurisdiction that the VA says, "Oh, we have this clinic, and it can do this, but it can't do this. Therefore, bill us for this, but not this." That's the VA's decision, and that's why you may want to bill Medicare directly for some services. So let's say that this particular service is something the VA doesn't have, then you just bill Medicare directly because that VA is never going to authorize it. Now you could inform the patient of that, right? I'll make sure you inform the patient. Now, can you bill Medicare if the patient has unmet deductible? Absolutely. We can consider things for deductible and other things like that. So yes, you want to make sure you're aware of that. Part A claims to continue a benefit period. This is a little bit different than some of the other things. It's not when you're in a VA facility, it's when you're in a non-VA facility, but we do need to look at certain things that are being covered. So it depends on the situation and whether or not you'll bill Medicare all as one, whether or not you need to even bill us. Um, so we'll talk more about that in just a little while. All right. So if, if there are payments, and here's one of the things that keeps coming up a lot for us, the difference between inpatient and outpatient right here, difference. If there is an inpatient payment from the VA, depending on the payment methodology, Medicare may not be able to make any other payment. So let me give you an example. If the payment methodology is based on reasonable cost for the entire stay, we may be able to consider it. This would be a critical access hospital inpatient. Not going to say we're going to because we may not be able to because remember, reasonable cost has certain things that go with it. However, it's an inpatient perspective payment system. This is based on a diagnosis. The diagnosis is not separated out by days. It's not separated out by anything like that. So even if the VA paid for one day and the patient was inpatient for 20 days, the Medicare payment methodology will not allow you to pay this. So that says, hey, wait, you already got a payment. We can't pay on the same thing because we can't break it out day by day. Our payment methodology does not allow this. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. On outpatient care, the VA coverage considered by line. So when we look at it, it's the data service and the line item that goes with it. What's on this? Did they pay today? Did they not? And each one is a little bit different. So hopefully that makes sense for everyone. It's a little different than in inpatient care. 
So on a outpatient claim, could you bill Medicare and have VA lines and non-VA covered? Absolutely. Again, that just depends on the line and how we build them. All right, so that's how kind of the payment methodology. The next few signs are designed to cover some of the billing scenarios with lots of questions on them. I tried to build all the slides in together to hopefully get you what you need and hopefully I didn't miss anything. So let's start off with VA authorized. So inpatient, don't submit a claim. This makes sense. You're not submitting anything for payment. Just don't submit a claim. Now, if you say, hey, they did this, this, whatever. Okay, now you're adding in a lot more scenarios and I can give you an example. There was observation care that didn't go into the inpatient, so the VA didn't pay the observation care, but they did the inpatient. It's two different things. Now we've got an outpatient and an inpatient, okay? So if the VA authorizes it, you can submit a claim on a UB04 or 837I, which are gonna use condition code 21. No payment claim at patient's request. In other words, the patient's saying, hey, I still want you to bill Medicare. This will fit that scenario. It will allow you to bill us telling us the VA paid it. So we want to make sure we are aware of that. The CMS 1500 claim form or 837P, this is when you have to use the modifier GY. Why? Because it's statutorily excluded. Why is it statutorily excluded? Remember I showed you the section of the Social Security Act that said we can't pay if the VA pays? 1862A3, that's a statutory exclusion. It's a GY. But this would allow you that if the VA were to take their money back, you can then use one of the following options. Bill a new claim without the GY, complete a reopening to remove the modifier GY. So this just helps track that and gives you the option should something happen in the future. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense there. Let's move on to the next scenario that was given to me, partial authorization claims. Inpatient, do not submit a claim uh, when the VA paid. The VA did not pay, then submit a claim with condition code 26. So this would include any they didn't make any kind of payment at all. You want to make sure you let us know that. Outpatient claims on the um, submitted on a UB04 or 837I, you need to put the 21. You can use the GY for services not authorized. So this is for an entire date of service not authorized. This would be just one portion or one line item. Hopefully that makes sense. On the 1500 claim form, you will always again use the, the modifier GY because in the 1500 claim form or the 837P, it's a line by line basis. Hopefully that makes sense too. All right, if the VA straight up doesn't authorize it, use condition code 26, it's not authorized. Medicare consider this is primary, we're good. On the other hand, if it's an outpatient claim, you will again use condition code 26. So anytime you're billing on the UB or the 837I, condition code 26. On the CMS uh, 1500, you do need to add a narrative comment in item 19. Again, that's a paper claim form. You will add the same narrative, but you're going to add it to the narrative comments in the NTE segment. This is a segment. It's the comment segment. If you don't actually see the segments, and I did have a question come in that said, I don't know what a segment is, and I think they had already downloaded the PowerPoint. You, you may have an area on your software that just says, enter a comment here, and then it attaches it to the claim and appends it on the claim. It's actually putting it in this segment. You just don't know it, and that's fine as well. So when you go through those different billing scenarios, you want to make sure you're following the correct guidelines to get us to pay correctly. All right, so we're back to that question slide. Again, throw some stuff in chat, but I do want to talk a little bit about a couple pre-submitted questions before I do that. Okay. How do you I determine if a hospitalization is service connected with the VA? And this is gonna go back to the VA to ask them whether or not they're going to pay. So keep in mind, this doesn't talk about the other programs under the VA, it's only when the VA is giving us an authorized service in which they're paying. So if it's service connected or not, certain times they may pay for service connected or they'll always pay for service connected, but certain times they may pay for non-service connected as well. It's really up to them and it's based on the person's coverage that they have with the VA. Have anything to do with Medicare. So you'll have to go back to the VA to determine that. Um, next question, under what circumstances would Medicare pay an inpatient claim if the VA has already paid? And the answer is we don't. Now, if the VA coverage didn't cover something, that may be a different consideration. Or if the VA authorized something and the patient is trying to get a Medicare Part B service covered, which would be covered under the Part B portion of Medicare, you could bill it as a VA non-authorized service and Medicare Part B could cover it. It's very different things. 
Um, so I just wanted you guys to be aware of some of those different base answers. If you have more, let's put that in chat. I can help you out. But the end, do we have any questions in chat? We do have a few. The first one is, can we bill outpatient OT services to the VA, have off and bill outpatient PT to Medicare for the same patient on the same day? Sure you could. Um, and, and again, this is going to be based on the auth. So OT service authorized by the VA. Awesome. But then the patient also sees a PT that maybe they have an evaluation and maybe they have some modalities done and whatever. And that is not authorized. The patient says, yes, I still want you to bill. So you can bill those PT services. P, uh, the VA says, no, no, this isn't under the auth, but thanks for asking. So then you bill Medicare's primary. I know I said it very nicely. That's not really you know, how it all works. But yes, essentially, just because it's uh, it's not an all or nothing, it's a service by service on an outpatient basis. And I want you to keep that in mind. Thank you for putting outpatient in there because in a completely different realm of things. So uh, next question. Next question is, can we bill Medicare if VA denies for untimely? I ask because VA's timely filing is 90 days, so it would be timely to bill Medicare. The, the answer is yes, you can, and you would bill it as a VA denied service. In other words, the VA didn't pay for it, and then Medicare would look to see whether or not we can pay. But again, we're going to follow the Medicare regulations, so absolutely you can. Next question. Next question is, I thought I saw somewhere that we build Part A claims to report spell of illness for claims VA has paid. We are, are we supposed to do this? If so, what coding would we use? Uh, so look up non-payment claims. Um, in other words, it's a claim where we're billing us for is just literally to do exactly what you're talking about. So I don't know if you remember back a few slides I said, hey, you, this is when you would want to bill, which that's what you're talking about here. It's basically just to extend that spell of illness. The patient was still in inpatient care. You're not expecting us to pay anything. Um, so look up no pay claims or non-payment claims. I don't know the coding off the top of my head. Let me just see what we have available under no pay here. Because it might be right on our website and you might be able to get that information for you. Um, excluded services, just trying to find it. So this kind of, let's see, um, VA not authorized, the nope, 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 nope. VA partially authorized, VA not authorized. Uh, Tom, I think I, someone responded in the chat. They indicated nope. using 04 CC for Medicare Advantage plans. Um, thank you, yeah, thank you. I was trying to find that exact information. So thank you for whoever responded in the chat. That really helps me without me having to try to dig around for it. Um, so we can go ahead and move on then, Leanne. All right, the next question is, VA authorizes one heart cath, so they only pay for the cath, but not any interventions. Are you saying we can bill Medicare for the intervention by adding modifier GY to all other claim lines? That is correct, because the VA didn't authorize those interventions, and so they're going to pay for it, right? So you may need to bill the heart cath and everything that they did authorize, but if Medicare, you want Medicare to consider that intervention because the VA did not, you would want to tell us, hey, this is already covered under 1862 um, A3 to the VA. This line is not. So that way we can at least look at it and consider it. Now, I cannot guarantee and I will never say Medicare is going to pay because, again, there's a variety of other things that will happen within that. Um, so we will at least consider it, though. Any other questions? That is all we have in the chat at this time, Tom. All right. Let's move on. Oh. So we have a lot of questions that came in. Um, so that we're, stop you. Yeah. One just came in. I'm so sorry. Um, the claim that came in is we have claims where Medicare paid primary and then VA stated to send in the claim with the Medicare remit based on the fact that the claim is a uh, mill bill. Okay. Yeah, so you're going to want to follow that guidance. Um, so it's a little bit different. Medicare will pay as primary. We're good with that. Um, if the VA sends you money for anything, then of course you do have to return it back to Medicare. But that's where we're looking at that um, the other program that I was that I kept referencing. Hey, there's different programs. This is when the VA is primary and paying. That's what I keep trying to say. This is a different situation that you're putting into it, which is not exactly the same thing. The VA tells you to send it so you can build mill bill. That's different. It's two different things. That's military billing. It's a different. A program or a different section of the VA and that's not what we can really address because we don't know anything about it. We know that we pay following the Medicare rules. We assign patient liabilities following the Medicare rules and the VA does whatever they do with it. Is there anything else that came in? Nope, you're all set. 
Okay. Uh, so primary insurance, we had a lot of questions come in um, regarding this and, and when the VA is primary and what happens and all those different things. So I thought we would build this section in to try to help that. Hopefully this will um, end up hitting everything within the agenda and I didn't miss anything. So first question was primary coverage. The VA is not a primary insurance. Keep that in mind. And that became a very strong and clear item that some people felt like the VA was covered, was a primary coverage. Yes, the patient can say, I don't want the VA billed, just like they could any other, but it's not primary. The primary coverage still stands as group health plans and non-group health plans, and there are six types. Employer group health plan, large group health plan, and stage renal disease eligible. Um, liability and no-fault insurance, workers' compensation, and federal black loan. Some people argue that liability and no fault are different. I do understand that. Yes, they are different, but they work basically the same way. So that's why I always put them together. Here's the thing. If you want to learn about when Medicare is primary, any of these types of coverage, then you need to go out and review the encore presentations that we have. So it's not ever going to be a situation where the VA is primary to Medicare. Do not get this confused with TRICARE. And that was one of the questions that was asked. It is different. Yes, TRICARE for an active duty member can be primary. That is their job. That's an employment-based plan. That's TRICARE. It's a different program. There are also sometimes when the VA runs certain types of specialized care programs or specialized items, which then override the primary rules. That is different than general VA coverage. Each specialized program has its own set of rules. So, that's one of the mill bill programs, just as an FYI, I think it's a specialized program. So I can't talk about general coverage and all that and try to get all that in together. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense as to why some of these different things happen. All right, do you follow the Medicare or the VA rules? Well, guess what? You follow one set of rules and it's the set of rules that go with the billing. If it's denied based on that, you may need to recode, adjust your coding, follow the second set of rules because you can't bill the other one that way. So we may even return it to you if you're a UBO4 and 837i biller, or we may say it's unprocessable if you're a 1500 837p biller. So really, you got to make sure you follow the right rules. Sometimes the rules play nice together, and sometimes you're like, this rule didn't work with that rule. We understand that, but when you go to bill, you want to follow the rules of the one that you're billing. Sometimes the patient requests you, and you're, all, you're like, oh, that's really going to be almost two completely separate rules. I understand that. One of the questions was regarding Medicare Advantage plans and the VA coverage and how all of that works together. First of all, let me just say this. I don't work for a Medicare Advantage plan or a Part C plan. That's not my job. I work for traditional fee-for-service, Medicare Part A and B. So I don't have a lot to offer on this one because it, it is very different. I do know that there are what are called special needs plans that may work with the VA in a different manner or may consider the VA coverage and allow certain things to happen when working with the VA. That is a Medicare Advantage plan, and that's where the question was asked. But you have to go to each individual Medicare Advantage plan to find out what the coverage is and how it works with the VA, or does it not work with the VA? Do you have to bill the VA? All of those different types of things are not something that we can do for you because we are traditional fee-for-service Medicare, the Medicare administrative contractor underneath that program. Medicare as primary. When Medicare is primary, we cannot assist as secondary coverage. A lot of people ask us about this. So, sure, Medicaid, Medigap, TRICARE, and suppl supplemental coverage all still apply, but we can't help you with those questions. Just like when the VA pays and we're talking about the VA coverage, I can't give you a lot of information on that. <clears throat> Same thing will happen here. Now, um, I'm not really sure what the person's goal was with the question related to this, so I put this slide in here, kind of listed it out. If that person is on and wants more information, really help me and guide me, give me a better uh, question or maybe help throw a question into to start a conversation with myself, Leanne, so that we can kind of get you what what's to happen because this is what I got based on the question that was asked. So I apologize that I can't do a better job with this one. All right, we have a few minutes left and I do have some more questions. I will let you know that what I'd really like to start with is just some general pre-submitted questions Got about you know a few of those, and then we'll work into those other questions that are in the chat. So first, um, does the VA need to authorize if secondary? The VA is not secondary to Medicare, so therefore we can't talk about that. Remember, um, I did talk about the um, service that would be billed to Medicare from the VA 
that's a different program. Okay, a little bit separate benefit. We had someone bring up the mill bill. That's a separate area of the V8. It's not what we're talking about here. So sometimes that would need to go to and they can bill differently. So when we really talk about the VA coverage and how Medicare works with it, there's very little that we know once you leave, hey, the VA or Medicare pays. Because yes, you may bill us and then they may need a bill from you for whatever reason, but that's based on what the VA requests based on the coverage and the plan the person's in. Another question that we had was, any advice on how to better access the VA authorizations? I have nothing to offer for you there. Unfortunately, I don't know what a service is authorized or not. What we know is when the VA pays and you indicate that to us or someone else indicates that to us in a different manner. That's also why there are times, um, so there are also times when that happens and what happens is like, hey, I need this or I need that. We don't have anything to do with the VA, so we can't, help you in that manner. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, what is the best practice to determine if the patient has Medicare and the VA? Honestly, the best practice is to start off with talking with the patient because you really do have to determine first, do they have it? Two, what is their intent and who should be billed? It's not like you can just say, hey, they got VA, right? Um, so we want to make sure you're doing that. You follow the coding guidelines that the that the patient requested you to build that insurance or that coverage. So you wanna make sure you're doing all of those best practices. And determining if they have the VA and Medicare, no one-stop shop for that. Unfortunately, it's just not a one-stop shop. So I'm gonna apologize for that right up front. Take a look at it though, but keep in mind, there's a lot going on with it. So you will have to contact the VA to find it. They can cover it and then you'll have to contact Medicare. Again, VA coverage can be based on location. Where's the VK, VA facility, such as the hospital or clinic located? Do they have that specialty? Is it located close to another one where they would have that specialty, even though this one doesn't? So VA coverage is very different than Medicare coverage. Um, a next question came in is, is there anything specific for the VA and rural health clinics? And is there any difference in the basic rules? And the answer is not in this case. Uh, rural health clinic follows the Medicare guidelines just like anything else. And because there's nothing specific to the, their um, billing standards, again, you'd use the condition codes that I mentioned when you bill on the UBO for the 837P. So nothing super specific for rural health at all applies. Was there any updates to VA coverage and Medicare in 2024? Nope, nothing going on there. So there's a variety of different things uh, going on with that, but no, nothing going on. Um, who is primary if the VA sends patients to us because they don't have their own specialty available at the VA? Okay, well, that case, remember, it's is it authorized? If the VA gave an authorization, then yeah, that's awesome. That's going to be primary. If not, then you bill it as a VA unauthorized service, and we talked about that. And then the next question is, does TRICARE for Life affect this, or is this only for patients who don't have TRICARE for Life? Remember, TRICARE for Life and TRICARE is a separate benefit program from the VA. They're different programs. While the same person may use the VA and TRICARE for Life, they are not the same program. Medicare is primary for TRICARE for Life. TRICARE for Life works with Medicare supplemental stuff. In other words, what we don't pay. Now, for those of you that don't know what TRICARE for Life is, it's someone that has worked or served, I'm sorry, has served in the military or their spouse has served. They are then eligible for TRICARE after serving for 20 years for the rest of their life. So when they come on to Medicare, they move their TRICARE to TRICARE for Life. And then we coordinate out Medicare pays first, TRICARE pays second. Not the same thing as the VA. A person can have VA without having TRICARE for Life as well. So that it does not affect it, and please be very careful when referring to this. Um, the next question, what identifies patients as possibly having the VA? Being an independent laboratory, we don't constantly get clear information. Let me first say, I do understand this. We don't necessarily have that information in our system. Here's the thing, Medicare doesn't return that information, it doesn't give it back to us, so we don't have that information as well. If you're an independent lab and you're getting a specimen from somewhere, you can work with that provider to figure out what they have on file, that's an easier way. You can contact the patient, sometimes the patient's not going to know who you are because you didn't take the specimen, right? So a variety of different factors can play into that. Next question. Why doesn't the WPS portal have a tab that says VA coverage, like MSP or MA? Because this is not the same type of coverage. 
you that is clear to everyone. It's not the same type of coverage. So because it's two different things, the type of coverage does vary significantly there. All right. A uh, couple of questions came in regarding ambulance services. I'm going to kind of lump them together and talk a little bit. I did explain a little bit more, but as I lump them together, if I don't get quite enough, throw it back into chat for me. Should, uh, should you follow the VA guidelines? Absolutely. If the VA denies the claim, then you should follow the Medicare guidelines for consideration. So start there. Do all ambulance services have to be authorized by the VA to pay? No. If an ambulance is considered and meets the VA guidelines for emergency services, the VA may consider and pay it without an authorization. It's a little bit different because we do have that. Now remember, Medicare does say it has to be medically necessary, so you still have to follow the Medicare guidelines even if the VA doesn't pay it. So it does have to meet both uh, pieces of information. All right, next um, I'm going to open to uh, going to open to any live questions. Leanne, any live? We do have one. Um, so the question is, I'm still a little confused. I'm billing a Part A informational claim for a stay that VA authorized and paid. Will the 04CC work for VA as well as MA? If we report a 04 and the patient isn't enrolled in an MA plan, we get claims RTP'd saying patient is not enrolled in MA plan. I'm going to take that question back and I'm going to email that out to everyone. Um, I don't know the answer to that directly off the top of my head. I'm not sure if it's the 04 condition code. That's why I was on the website kind of looking. I know there's some criteria that go with it. Um, and so let me give you an example. There are times when you don't have to bill at all, even though it's inpatient. Medicare does not consider that as part of certain things, but there are other times you may need it. So for instance, a skilled nursing facility trying to get the three-day qualifying stay, then we would want certain things. So I can't give you a direct answer. I, I don't have that prepared. So I would like to take that back and be able to email everyone else out. Um, I'll get you that answer later. Is there any other questions? We have no other questions at this time. All right, awesome. Go ahead and move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for listening. I would encourage you again, provide that feedback. It really does help me. Remember, we want to get the good, the bad, the ugly, the ways to improve any of that that you want to get. One other key piece of feedback that I would like you to include is any other topic you'd like to see. It does not need to relate to the Medicare and the VA coverage or anything like that. Just what other education would you like to see us do? It really helps us. I would ask that you do look at the live events page and sign up for any of those additional webinars that may be coming up. There's also a whole bunch of different items. So please take the opportunity to sign up for that. On behalf of myself, Leanne, all of Provider Outreach and Education, thanks for attending. We hope that uh, you gained some inform valuable information from this. We look forward to your survey comments and hope that you can join us in the future. You may now disconnect. <laughs>